Our next speaker is an iOS developer who comes from a background in audio engineering. Uh, she's the head of app development at Dennis Publishing in London, Sally Shepard. Hello. Oh. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Awesome. So, yep, I'm Sally. Um, a little bit of background of why I'm talking about accessibility. So, my dad has quite severe problems with his vision. My mom had ALS, so she lost most of her motor skills. And my brother's extremely dyslexic. So, combined, I've seen firsthand how much of a difference things like accessibility can make for people. Ah, uh, there we go. Ah, clicker's working now. So there's a lot of reasons why, from, from people that I've heard, like why their app isn't accessible. And they're mostly myths. So you've got things like, well, it's not that many people that actually use accessibility, or it's time consuming to add support, or my app is too complicated to be accessible. And you know, even I, I don't know actually how to test it. So let's first talk about people. There are more than one billion people in the world living with some form of a disability. That's one in seven people. And it's a growing population. So more people are living longer. And the longer you live, the more likely you are to have a disability. And it can make things extremely difficult. Basic tasks can take elaborate planning. But we can use technology to overcome a lot of these challenges. And a really amazing example of this is the iWriter. So this is a project that people have been working on. It's all open source. And they've been working on to create a low cost system that does eye tracking so that people with ALS can draw just using their eyes. And they've been working with this guy who used to be a graffiti artist. And they actually made it so that he could draw. And then they actually went out and projected his artwork onto buildings. So it's really amazing that they've done this for him. So what are some things that we can do in iOS? Well, let's start with people who have a vision impairment. Vision impairments can gra greatly differ. So blind doesn't necessarily mean complete and total darkness. It can be you know, anything from not being able to see in the center to having things obscured from the sides. Things like macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy. I think it's still playing, yep. <laughs> uh, glaucoma, cataracts. So this can severely impact like, how you'd use things. And even how would you use an iPhone if all you can see is just a tiny little bit in the center? So Apple have made something called VoiceOver, which is a really incredible screen reading technology. And it basically replicates what's on screen by speaking it to the user. So although it wouldn't actually come up with a speech bubble, this is just a representation of basically what it would say. So mail, one new item, double tap to, to open. And it's available in astounding 36 languages as of iOS 7. I haven't actually checked if they've added any more for iOS 8. Uh, and it's available on iOS and OS 10 as well as the iPod Shuffle back in the day. And users can also extend VoiceOver by using it with Braille. And most people, when you say Braille, think of this. This isn't the kind of Braille I'm talking about. This is the kind of Braille. So it's actually dynamic Braille. It's refreshable. And it's usually combined with something like a keyboard. So this, along this bottom row, those are all Braille cells as well as a Braille keyboard. So some people prefer it's a little faster for them to enter text in. So basically, they've taken a device that really shouldn't be accessible at all, and they've made it completely accessible. And that's really amazing. So let's see it in action. Hopefully, <laughs> I won't have too many technical problems getting this set up. Uh, bear with me two seconds. Oh, there we go. Now you can all see my password now. 
I'll have to change that. <laughs> uh, cool. So the first step with VoiceOver is to enable it. So if you go into settings and then into general, they've kindly moved accessibility up a bit and it's right at the top. So if we turn it on, let's see if the audio works. Voice over on. Okay. Voice over. Heading. Voice over. On. Everybody Double hear that? Voice over. Ooh. Heading. Everybody hear that okay? Yeah. Cool. So voice over, if you see first, there's the cursor that it draws around the currently focused element. And you can navigate either by tapping on tap items. Tap once to select an item. Or you can swipe. Double tap to activate the selected item. Tap once to voice over speaks items on the screen. <laughs> uh, you can also use three fingers to scroll. Rows 4 to 15 of 15. And yeah, let's see. I think that's it for the kind of basic things. You can also do a cool thing uh, called screen curtain. Screen curtain on. Which just completely takes away the display. So that's kind of use compact voice. Braille. A really good Button. way Braille. of actually Button. testing. Braille. Button. How good you are at voiceover. Screen curtain uh, off. I'll leave. <laughs> I'll leave it on Home. for ease right now. Settings. So double tap camera. First, let's double have tap a, open. First, let's have a look at an app that uh, has good accessibility support. Camera, flash, off, HDR, or camera chooser, viewfinder, image. So, camera is not Double something focus. <laughs> that you'd necessarily think would be a very accessible app, and hope you guys don't mind. Viewfinder, image. I don't know if it's actually going to image. very well with viewfinder. the lighting. Auto -focused. No. Viewfinder, image. Oh, Double tap to focus. No. Usually it's actually viewfinder. really good at um, finding faces, and it will tell you. Um, image. Basically, oh focus. yeah, I could camera actually... Camera chooser, back facing, camera chooser, Selfie. one face, small face, <laughs> face centered. So it actually finds me, which is quite cool, and it tells you kind of Viewfinder. where the person's Image. face is. Viewfinder. Image. Zero faces, oh. one face, small face, <laughs> face centered. So if I took a photo... Viewfinder. Image. Take picture. But take picture. Dim. Uh, photo and video viewer. If I then but go to actually look at it, it would tell me... 4,208. 4,000... Not a very good photo. <laughs> Portrait. Nine fifty-eight. One face. Crisp. Dark. Image. So it actually gives you a description of of what it's taken, which is which is quite cool. Home. I'll Camera. I'm going to delete that later. Double tap open. Uh, so the next app. Flappy Bird. Flappy Bird, which you've already seen open. a bit of today, <laughs> but um, it's quite popular. And you'd think. Mobile data is turned off for Flappy Bird. Yeah. You can turn settings. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But. <laughs> cool. So, Flappy Bird. So voiceover does a makes a sound when it can't actually find an element. You kind of hear that little... So, there, there's absolutely, I'm tapping like crazy, and nothing's happening. So there's nothing in that app that's oh. actually accessible. Flappy bird. So... Double tap open. Let me just switch back to... Screen lock. The display. Coming back. <laughs> Always fun switching inputs. No. Cool. So there's a few basic things you can do to make things in your app accessible. So the first thing is saying, oh, okay, I seem to have lost some of the screen resolution. <laughs> um, but basically, you, that says basically send button dot is accessibility element equals yes. So you don't always have to enable 
accessibility on every single thing, because if you're using a view as a container for other things, you might not necessarily need it. Oh, this is actually going to be problematic. <laughs> Keep talking. Keep talking. Okay. Uh, so the next thing is accessibility label. And the labels are used to, their, uh, to identify the element. And UIKit takes care of most things for you, actually. And by default, it will use the title of the element. But if you're using like an image-based thing, like a custom switch or something like that, then you definitely need to make sure you include uh, a label for it. So you don't need to include the actual type of element. So if it's a button, you don't need to say, you know, play button, just play or send. <laughs> hey, cool. Beautiful. OK, although I lost my timer now. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, so accessibility hint. And this basically describes the outcome of performing an action. So again, this is actually optional. You don't always have to do it. And users actually have the control to turn off hints. But keep it really brief. Start with a verb describing the result. And don't make it sound like a command. So sends the message, plays the song, that kind of thing. And accessibility traits are basically a combination of traits that best characterize the element. UIKit controls, they default to standard uh, traits. You can also combine traits with a bitwise OR operator. And if you are subclassing a control, you can also call super to get its the traits of the, of the class that you're inheriting from. So this is a list of all the traits as of iOS 7. Again, I haven't actually updated my slides for iOS 8. Uh, not all of these are available backwards to 3. I don't know who's still supporting 3. I hope none of you. <laughs> Um, but yeah, check the docs if, if you want to do more weird things like supporting old versions of iOS. Um, accessibility value is also something that's quite good. So if you're using something like a slider, by default it would say something like 50%, which isn't exactly a good thing on something like text size because it's more like a medium size or 16 point or something like that. So you can actually override it or set it so that it says something a little bit more meaningful. So how do we add support if we're using zips and storyboards? It's really, really, really easy. You basically have a tick box, and then you set the label, optionally set the hint, and then add traits, and you're done, pretty much. <laughs> uh, so if you're doing UIKit-based applications and, you're, and you want to add support programmatically, uh, again, really simple. If the values aren't changing that often, you can just use the setters. If it's something where the actual, um, if, if the values are going to change a lot, then you should actually just override the methods. So you'd override accessibility label. Well, yeah. Or probably value or traits, but yeah. Um, you can also do th cool things like find out if voiceover is on. So this is a really nice thing to do. If you have any sort of analytics running in your app, you could actually log how many people are using your app that have VoiceOver on, and then also compare it to if you add support, and then find out how many more people you get. And VoiceOver has the ability, as of iOS 6, that you can actually control where the cursor is. So it's quite easy to set. You just basically pass in the element that you want to have focus on. And then sometimes you might also want to let a user directly interact with an interface. It might be more complicated than just a bunch of buttons and labels on a screen. So something like a piano app or a drawing app, where you don't want the user to be interrupted by voiceover. So all you need to do is add a trait that says, allows direct interaction. And there's a bunch of notifications that you can use. There are post notifications, and you can also listen out for ones. So like if the screen changes or you get new data into your app and you want to say, oh yeah, the weather value is now changed and it's now 65 degrees out, something like that. And then Magic Tap was another thing that they introduced in iOS 6, which is quite cool. So this basically lets you do more or less anything you want to do. <laughs> um, 
So it's basically a shortcut. Users can do a two-finger double tap. So on something like a, on the phone app, for example, if a user is on an active phone call and they do a two-finger double tap, it actually ends the phone call. So it just makes things easier for the user. So you can also implement this in as many places as you want in your app. And it, if you don't implement it, it just goes up the kind of chain to try to find anybody who might have it. And then there's also a custom how to get back to the previous thing. So if you're using like a, custom, like a, a normal navigation bar and you have a back button, then everything will work kind of as normal. But if you've done anything a little bit more custom, you probably want to implement this so that people can actually get back to the previous view. So what happens if you're not using UIKit? Don't worry. <laughs> you can still do it. It's a little bit more effort, but it's not that bad. Uh, sadly, I don't have enough time to really go through it because it's a little bit more involved. Uh, but there is some really great sample code from last year's WWC about how to do this. But all you really need to do is implement the UI accessibility container protocol. So testing voiceover. So now that you've implemented things, how do you actually know you've done it correctly? So the first thing is to have a plan, like all testing, right? If you have test plans, user stories, use cases, requirements, anything, if you don't have any of this or any sort of list that says these are the things my app does, then you really should. <laughs> um, so basically, you just need to go through each use case or test and make sure that a user can perform it with VoiceOver on. So you can use the simulator. You can use the accessibility inspector. I haven't actually checked. I imagine it's still there in iOS 8. I yet to check. <laughs> um, but basically, it, it's a little HUD that pops up. And you, it tells you the label, the traits, the frame, and any notifications that might be happening. But it doesn't really give you a good kind of experience of how, what it's really like. So it's important to test on a device. And there's also an accessibility. If you, once you've set up VoiceOver, you just have to triple tap the home button, and you can turn VoiceOver on. You can also tell Siri to turn VoiceOver on, which is also kind of cool, <laughs> if Siri understands you. Um, and then screen curtain is a really important one, that if you are testing it, it's good just to make sure you're not cheating and looking at the screen. That you triple tap to turn the screen off and make sure that it still works. Most importantly is user testing. So Apple Viz forums are really great. There's loads of people on there that are already used to using things like test flight, or the soon to be new test flight with iOS 8. And they're more than happy to test things and give you really great feedback of how you can improve voiceover support. Uh, usually at WWC there's labs as well. Although those were yesterday, <laughs> not so helpful right now. Uh, but you can talk to lots of charities and local councils or various support groups. So now let's talk about physical and motor skills. So these are people that can have, again, a great variety of, of difficulties. Some people might not be able to do gestures or even hold a phone. So how, how is it that they're actually able to use an iPhone. So the first thing Apple introduced was something called assistive touch. And it's basically a little software button for people who can't actually press a hardware button. And once you activate it, you get this first menu. And you can then kind of basically perform gestures just by tapping in the menu. And then switch control, which seriously was the coolest feature of iOS 7. Uh, you can basically use your entire phone just by using a switch. And you can also set up multiple switches. So if you wanted different, different switches to do different things, you can do that. So oh, let's do a quick demo. That last one went so well. <laughs> uh, so. so I've brought a keyboard. Do notification. Try again. Oh. <laughs> Well, you already Thursday, the 5th of June. Password anyway. I should turn voiceover off, actually. Selected. Voice over, voice over off. Cool. So to turn switch control on, uh, again, general 
accessibility, and then all the way at the bottom is physical and motor. So we'll go into switch control. And then I've already, I've got a fancy Bluetooth keyboard. And I've already connected it to my phone. And then to add a switch, you just go into switches, add switch, external. And then you just press the key on either the keyboard or the switch that you want to use. And it will ask you to name it. So we'll just call that tap. Oops. Yeah. We'll call it tap. And you can choose all sorts of different actions to have your switch do. But we'll just make it do a tap. And then uh, I think everything else is probably OK. So we'll start by turning it on. So you see you get a cursor. And it just kind of goes through all the different items on the screen. So if you want to select a thing, all you have to do is wait for it to get to that thing. And then when you, if you wanted to go back out, it has those dotted lines. And that's when you tap on it to go back out. So I'm going to do some math. I'm really bad at math this early in the morning. So we're going to use calculator. <laughs> Does anybody have any math problems they'd like to solve or numbers? Two plus two. Oh, let's try that. So two. Uh, <laughs> obviously said it a bit fast for myself this morning. Ah, oh, uh, okay. Maybe we'll just do twenty-two plus something. <laughs> twenty-two plus five <laughs> equals twenty-seven. Yay! <laughs> Switch control is quite cool. So now that we've done some math, let's have a look at our friend Flappy Bird. Oh, not notes. <laughs> uh, let's see. So, ah, that's, yeah, I'm too slow this morning. Okay. Hey. So Flappy Bird, so again, we saw earlier Flappy Bird doesn't really have anything in it that's accessible. This is what happens when switch control can't find anything. I like to call this Cylon mode, because it does that kind of back and forth. It's not quite so scary. Uh, so basically, you get crosshairs. Uh, you can basically simulate a tap. So let's see how this goes. <laughs> OK, ready? Oh, it's kind of, oh, it hasn't actually worked yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> that didn't work too well. <laughs> um, so that's switch control. <laughs> so let me just go back to the display. Hopefully this will be a little happier this time. That'd be nice. Maybe not. Oh, 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 OK. <laughs> it's gone back to doing the, the huge screen thing. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> so basically, <laughs> I can actually do this part probably without slides. Um, there's no documentation on switch control. Although I think there might be a little bit in iOS 8. Again, I'm not sure. I'm not really sure if I'm supposed to discuss it anyway. Um, but the way to add switch control support is actually by just implementing the UI accessibility support in general. So if you make something, if you add a button trait or add a gesture recognizer to something, switch, and co switch control will go, oh, hey, that's a, that's a thing that I can access. So. <laughs> I always love doing overly complicated presentations. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, again, so with testing, how you test switch control is by using the device. Um, there's nothing you can do in the simulator. Again, there might be an iOS 8, don't know. Um, oh, is it, is it working? Or? <laughs> uh, oh, yay. Oh. 
Uh oh. <laughs> the presentation gods are not smiling on me today. <laughs> okay. Next one. Hmm. Uh, let me try moving to. Okay. Weirdest thing I've seen Keynote ever do. <laughs> cool. Okay. Hey. <laughs> Okay, so we've gone through basically, yeah, switch control is awesome. Test it on a device. Also try to get user testing done. So how do people with learning difficulties use an iOS device? Again, there's a range of things that can happen with people. So people might have autism, cognitive difficulties, or just difficulty focusing on things. And iOS devices can be really, really distracting because there's just so many things that you just want to tap on all the time. I find it distracting enough on my own. So the thing that Apple introduced was guided access. And it basically enables people to disable the home button and also kind of set areas on the screen to say you can't, you know, these parts aren't actually usable. So you can also add your own support to your app if you want, especially if you're doing apps for kids. It's a really good thing to add. And there's a UI guided access restriction delegate don't have enough time to really go through that. So. <laughs> but why should you add support? Well, you all write apps for iOS devices, or I assume you are, none of you are lost, <laughs> and hoping this was an Android conference or something like that. Um, Apple cares immensely about accessibility. It's part of their core values. And Tim Cook on an earnings call got a little upset at somebody a few months ago and said, well, when we work on making our devices accessible by the blind, I don't consider the bloody ROI. And, you know, this is, he actually has better quotes as well, but I didn't get a chance to put them in. But, um, yeah, there was a speech he did at Auburn University, and you should definitely have a listen to that. So, do you actually want to exclude people from using your app? There's, I mean, a billion people is a lot of people to exclude, and yeah, not all of them have iOS devices, but still. <laughs> but everybody wants more users, right? You know? 
And when you make your app accessible, you actually get people who are happier and more loyal and just way more evangelical about your app. And accessibility is for everyone. So things like Siri and uh, dictation and the new stuff in iOS 8 where you can send audio messages through the Messages app, that's, those are all awesome features for us, but they're also really awesome accessibility features. And lastly, craftsmanship. You know, making your app accessible and usable by everyone shows extreme attention to detail and commitment to quality. So how many apps are there that are accessible? <sighs> well, <laughs> there's no real stats on it. So, but it's definitely not all of the apps or else I wouldn't be here speaking. Um, but do any of you guys have apps that are accessible? That you know of? Oh, yay. Let's give them a round. <laughs> That's awesome. Cool. So that wasn't everybody for people who can't see the audience. <laughs> um, but so what can we do as a, as a really great community to improve this? Well, if you have any open source code, then include support and then also have instructions on, on how to do anything else. If you use open source and something doesn't have support, then add it and do a pull request. Also think about it from the start. Don't just put it in the backlog. Don't just kind of go, oh, I'll get to that later. Don't put accessibility in the backlog. You wouldn't ship your app looking like this. So, and this is basically what it would look like if you didn't have voiceover support. <laughs> so also talk about it more. You know, get more involved at meetups, talk to people, tweet about it, block about it, make it part of your coding standard. And get involved with as many charities or groups as possible. They're super, super happy when people contact them. But there's still a lot to do. Even though Apple have made these amazing APIs and there's lots of compatible hardware, there's still people who can't use your app for whatever reason, and there's still people who can't even use an iPhone. So what are some things that we can do to try to improve this? First, spend a whole day, a whole day, <laughs> using VoiceOver or Switch Control to really understand what it's like. It will give you a much better idea of what are the challenges are for people. If you have any hackathons or hack days coming up, go into it thinking, I'm going to do something with accessibility. So I did one where it was hosted by Spiro, and I made a thing so you can do gestures with the Spiro, and it outputs it to the phone and reads it out. Also work with a charity or to run a hackathon or hack day. Even if it's only a few developers, it really helps. And ultimately, as a developer, it's down to you to make your app accessible. You can't rely on designers. Like they can obviously make things a little bit easier, but ultimately it's you. So it is a lot of people. It's really simple to implement. No app is too complicated to be accessible, and testing is actually quite straightforward. So here's some resources, uh, the accessibility, testing accessibility guide, sample code for non-UI kit, uh, accessibility programming guide, and also inclusive design toolkit has some really cool things for kind of finding out you know, what vision might look like on different things or stuff like that. So, thank you. <laughs> Sorry for all the technical difficulties. <laughs> cool. um, I'm not sure if I have time for any questions. Yes. Yes? Questions? <laughs> That was a great talk. Thank you. Uh, my question was: Does Apple share uh, in some way what are the numbers of you know people ac using accessibility features? Sadly, no. <laughs> I'd really love to know, though. I know. Hopefully. I think that would be really insightful to get yeah. encourage people to like add more stuff to their yeah. apps. Yeah. In, in the talk, the Auburn talk that Tim Cook gave, he said he got like a hundred emails a day from people saying like, this is such an amazing thing. I was able to, like my son was able to say, I love you for the first time and stuff like that. So it, it is a lot of people. And I think there's more people using accessibility with iOS devices than Android or Windows. So does any other firm track the statistics like Pew Research or? I don't think so. Not that I've, not that I've been able to find. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> You can find me afterwards or follow me on Twitter. Cool. Thanks.